Well, Larry King isn't a name that we hear very much anymore. There was a time when he was one of the best known interviewers, especially on CNN, and made news regularly with uh, interviews of various people. We meet him on television now every now and then on a, an infomercial he does or on some obscure channel. But when he was very significant a number of years ago, he was one night being on the David Letterman show and the situation was reversed. So he was the one being asked the question. And David Letterman asked him in the course of that, uh, Larry, if you could interview anyone in history, who would you interview? Oh, King said, that's easy. It would be uh, Jesus Christ. And Letterman was a little bit taken back because Larry King is Jewish by heritage and it seemed like a, an unexpected thing. He said, well, what would you ask him? Oh, he said, I'd, I'd ask him, were you really born of a virgin? Because that would make all the difference in history. Well, it's an interesting answer. It's probably not the exactly right one. You'd be better to ask him, who are you really? Because the virgin birth was just an evidence of that. But he's quite right to say that everything depends on what Christmas is all about. You know, there are three kinds of Christmases, and we are experiencing them all. There's the commercial Christmas, and some of us are caught up in it. Somebody's already asked me, have you done your shopping, finished your Christmas shopping? And all the answer is no, but that's a part of it. And for business people, that's an issue when we think of how much angst and frustration and anger we hear from people who at the most productive part of their year are being asked to shut down. And we know the challenge of the commercial part of Christmas. It's just a part of it all. And then there's the cultural part of Christmas. It's something our culture does. And it fills the stores and all kinds of other things, but the more prominent features are Santa Claus and, uh, and all of the trappings around that story. But then there's the Christian Christmas. And that gets pushed into the background, but it's the center part. If there is nothing beyond Christmas except the commercial and the cultural part, then something significant has been lost. So this morning, we're going to come back to the passage we've been looking at in John chapter 1. And this morning, we look right at the heart of the Christmas story, not earth up, not as we've heard the story so wonderfully told in Luke and in Matthew's gospel about angels appearing to shepherds and a baby in a manger and Joseph and Mary being caught up in all of that. That's a wonderful part of the Christmas story. Those are the events as they happened earth level. But John helps us see it from another level entirely. A level from God's perspective on what is happening on Christmas Day. So... We're just going to be looking at one verse this morning, but we're going to read all 18 of the verses that begins John's gospel and part of the prologue of that gospel. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not grasped it. Translated here, overcome it, and that is right. Grasp it to control it. Or grasp it, it could be translated, did not understand it, comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the baptizer. He came as a witness to bear witness about that light that all might believe through him. He was not that light. But he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, which shines upon everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own home, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. If you look at verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then you look at Verse 14, 23 words in the Greek text, just short. And then those initial four, and the word became flesh. Taking verse one and verse 14, we have the two most important and yet difficult of all the truths in the Bible. Verse one introduces us to the Trinity that the one God exists in more than one person. And verse 14 involves us with the incarnation, that God became a man. We can put labels on that, the Trinity and the incarnation, and we'll try to talk about some of it, but we will never comprehend all that those two things mean. And yet that's the very heart. C.S. Lewis was right, the incarnation, the word became flesh, is the grand miracle, the supreme miracle. There's all kinds of other miracles that Jesus did or related to the Lord Jesus, but the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead would have no meaning were he not the God having come as man. So I want you to notice verse 14, and we're going to walk our way through it. There's three kind of clauses in it. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory glory is of the one and only of the father full of grace and truth and i just want us to unpack those two those three clauses one after another the first one is the nature of who jesus was the god man Now, we've already looked at the first part, but let's go back and think about it. The Word. Back in verse 1, we were introduced to the the Word. The Word is something that gives expression to something that's otherwise unseen. I may be thinking something, but unless I speak it. And so John has chosen that word to talk about, that term Word, to talk about the Lord Jesus as the expression of who God is, the way in which he's made himself known. God spoke, and by a word, all of creation came into being. But he says three things. First of all, he says, the word preexisted creation. In the beginning, the word was. Not in the beginning, the word came into being. And the word is eternal. He is without beginning or end. He preexisted creation. As a matter of fact, Paul will say, by him all things were created, things in heaven and earth. All things were created by him and for him. Not only did he pre-exist creation, he coexisted with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And with there talks about the kind of relationship one person has with another. But then he goes on to say, and the word was God. He pre-existed as God pre-exists as eternal. He coexists with God and he exists as God in and of himself. And now we're into the ministry of the Trinity and we're not gonna unpack it further, but there is one God and yet two distinct persons can be called God. And this word now is described only John shifts and he begins to talk about the light, and he won't come back to use the term word until verse 14. And he talks about the light entering into the world. 
into the darkness of the world. Bruce has already mentioned that tomorrow is the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. And for us, it's not notable, but if you're up in northern Canada or up in Alaska, you're living this day in total darkness, or at least tomorrow. And uh, I've never had that experience. We had shorter days up in Canada in the, in the winter time, but nothing like being in darkness all the time. And that picture of all of a sudden the light breaking into the darkness that was on the world, but it was a person. He came into the world. He'd made the world, but the world didn't recognize him. And John has jumped to talk about the coming of the Lord, but now in verse 10, uh, verse 14, he goes back to explain exactly who he is. And the word became flesh. Now, let me be a little technical here, but it's important. You'll note, remember back in verse 1, it said, and the Word was God. He didn't become, pardon me, in the beginning was the Word. It wasn't that in the beginning the Word became. The Word is eternal and preexistent, but now the Word becomes. Something He was not, He becomes. And John is going to explain this, but the word become has about it the idea of addition, not subtraction. In other words, he didn't become less than he was. As the word, he added to himself something that he had not yet been. Sort of, as I think about my own experience, I was a man, and at a certain point, I became a father. It didn't affect my being a man in any way, but I became something I was not before. The Word did not cease to be all he was as the Word, but he became something that he was not. And what he was not was flesh. The Word became flesh. Now John is using that to describe the Word becoming a human person. The most obvious part of a human person is that we are flesh and blood. But he doesn't mean simply that Jesus became a body or received a body. It means he became a human person. He took a full human nature. All that a human being is, Jesus became. He had a body. He had a human mind. He had a human will. He had human emotions. He was born as all babies are, with crying and with all of the things that are around it. He nursed at his mother's breast. He was sustained and cared for in all of the weakness of that. He became genuinely human. The disciples knew him. And if we think back to 1 John chapter 1, he said, That was from the beginning, that which we've heard, that which we've seen, that which we've looked upon with our eyes, that which we've handled concerning the word of life. Jesus was physical, touchable, in all of those kind of ways. The word become flesh is not 50% God and 50% human. He is 100% God and 100% human. Disciples live with him. It says in the book of Hebrews, that since the children, meaning other human beings, were made of flesh and blood, he had to be make like us in all ways. So we go through the book of John and chapter eight, uh, chapter four, he's tired. In chapter four, he's hungry. And so the disciples go to buy food. He's thirsty and asks a woman at the well to give him something to drink. Later in chapter 11, when his friend dies, he's at the grave and he weeps in grief. In chapter 11, as he thinks about the cross, we're told that he was troubled and disturbed. And he repeats that again to the disciples in the upper room. Now is my soul troubled and I'm in great distress. He was beaten and he bled. He was battered and he stumbled under the cross so he could not carry it. 
He was nailed to a cross and he died. He was pierced with a sword and out came flesh and blood. He was fully human. So those are three great facts about the word became flesh. The word became, who became flesh was fully, unchangeably God. The word who became flesh was fully, truly human. The word who became flesh was one person. There wasn't a God side and a Jesus side. He was one person simultaneously. James Packer puts it like this. The baby born at Bethlehem was God made man. The word had become flesh, a real human baby. He'd not ceased to be God. He was no less God than before, but he had begun to be a man. His was not now God minus some elements of his deity, but God plus all that he'd made his own by taking manhood to himself. He who made man was now learning what it meant to be a man. He who made the angel who became the devil was now in a position where he could be tempted, could not indeed avoid being tempted by the devil. And the perfection of his being was only achieved by conflict with the devil. So we try and grab our minds around that. It, it, it escapes us. How could he be fully God and fully man? But that is the only one who is the Jesus of Scripture. And he's the only one who can save us. So even as we come and we think about the baby in the manger, there is a wonder about it that we need to try and get our minds around. That he is God, truly, fully become human. Not a kind of Superman in disguise. Not someone taking on a form. God himself, and no less, entered into space, into time and space for us. But when did it happen? When did the, uh, the incarnation take place? And how did it happen? I want to think of two great, or why did it happen? When did the word become flesh? And the answer is not in Bethlehem, but in Nazareth. Not in the manger, but in the womb of Mary. That God entered into history not, not by suddenly appearing when the baby was born, but at the very most intimate way. Let me read these words from Mary, Mary Harris in part. But as I read them, I was caused to think with wonder again. The wonder of the incarnation is that God did not choose to deliver his frail and perfect, final and perfect re revelation to mankind through an awesome prophet with miraculous powers or through a legion of angels dispatched directly from heaven with an infallible message. The word became flesh as a fertilized egg, a one-cell zygote in biological terms in the womb of Mary it is only by being magnified half a million times that a fertilized egg can be seen by the human eye. Even after two weeks, the embryo of Jesus was only less than a tenth of an inch long. At 18 days, the heart of Jesus began to beat, the heart that would beat rigorously until he surrendered his spirit to the Father. And he goes on to talk about fetal development in terms of all that Jesus experienced amazingly. The author of every human process himself underwent the same development as all humans experience in the womb. Here is a profound mystery that evokes astonishment, awe, and worship. God become man in a spot so tiny that it has to be millions of times magnified to even see it. How do we get our minds around that? How do we comprehend that he was the weakest of the weak in that particular way? And you women know all the things that can happen in that process. But that's how Jesus came.
came into our world. Why? Well, ultimately to reveal the Father. Verse 18 will go on to say it. No one's seen God at any time. The one and only God who's at the Father's side, he's revealed him. But it wasn't just revealing the Father, it was becoming the mediator who could stand between us and God. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us all. And then it was so that he could be the one who bore our sins. The only one who could pay the penalty of our sins was one who was a human, who came under the exact same judgment that we come under. His humanity was exactly like ours, except was not a fallen humanity. And he lived with sin. He knew no sin. He did no sin. There was no sin in him. So that he was qualified to be our perfect substitute on the cross, to bear the guilt that was due to us. And he was also fully human so that he could be our great high priest, a merciful and gracious high priest who knew what it was, knew what it was to stand at the graveside of his father and go through the experience of grief, knew what it was to experience poverty and weakness, to eke out his living with his hands and to live in a small, insignificant town who knew what it was to be rejected, but also to know life and enjoy life and all of the fullness of it. The Word became flesh, the wonder of the incarnation. And then the next little phrase is one that we can pass over quickly and dwelt among us. Well, part of that is saying that When Jesus came into the world, he dwelt among us. He lived in the midst of human beings. He did not live in splendid isolation, living top of a mountain or living in a a, a state of great luxury and splendor. So he was here, but he wasn't living in our life. One of the things that caused more than a little bit of cynicism over this last time is politicians who expect some people to do things and then live in isolation from the realities of life. Or wealthy people who talk about all that people should do and give and then go to their own retreat on an island somewhere where they can do all of these kind of things. Now, Jesus dwelt among us. He lived in the middle of us. He is, as he was prophesied, Emmanuel, God with us and God for us. It's hard to think of a more unlikely place for the God-man to come that in the squalor of Nazareth, a little town where somebody hears about him coming from there and says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But he lived right in the middle of it. He dwelt among us. But the interesting thing is that word dwelt. It's a word that literally means he tented among us. And, And it's a reminder that Jesus lived in a very ordinary, common way. The writer of Isaiah says, he had no stately form or beauty that we should desire him. There was no significance that we would look at him and say, yeah, that's a man above others. He lived in the most common way. He, the word became flesh and tented among us. I know you Americans aren't interested in it, and I'm not very interested in it either, but this past year has been an interesting one for the British royal family because uh, Harry and Meghan set aside their royal titles, Her Majesty, His Majesty, and then came, first of all, to live in Canada and live in the United States. But the interesting thing is they aren't dwelling among Americans. They are mansioning among Americans. They just bought a $15 million mansion. Jesus didn't mansion among us. 
He tempted among us. But there's something else going on. The word tented almost certainly in John's mind wants us to think back where God first made his presence on earth. And that was in the tabernacle. He pitched his tent among us. He tabernacled among us. And the book of Exodus, how God commanded that a worship place be built. And in the center of that would be the Holy of Holies. There was lots of splendor in that, but at the final analysis, it was just a tent, a portable tent that they could take across as they made their way to Canaan. But it was the place, a place above all places on earth where some important things happened. First of all, God presenced himself in that tent. God revealed himself at that tent. But most significantly, God dealt with sin in that tent. The Lord Jesus tented among us. He became the person and the way in which God was present among his people, God with us. He revealed the Father, but most of all, he not only was the one where, as it were, redemption was accomplished. He tented among us becoming the very sacrifice that the tabernacle required. If you think of John chapter two, just the very next chapter, he will say to the people, destroy this temple and I will build, build it in three days. And they scoffed at him about that. And then John says he was speaking about his body as the temple, as the tabernacle. So when John is telling us that the word became flesh, the God man tented among us, it talks about the ordinariness, it talks about the commonness, it talks about the human levelness of what he did, and then it reminds us of the astonishing God-centeredness of it. But it was his place for bearing our sins in his body on the cross. And John the Baptist later in this chapter will say, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. He tented among us. And then John says as the last phrase, and we beheld his glory. Glory as the one and only of a father, full of grace and truth. Well, there's a lot here and we don't have time to unpack it. We'll come back to some of it next week, but let me just notice a couple of things related to it. The we we saw his glory is clearly John and the apostles. They were eyewitnesses. They walked with him. They saw him. They came to the realization of who he was. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter will say at one particular experience, impossible that was. And, and when it says they saw his glory, The word saw has about it the idea of we perceived it because it wasn't out there on the surface so that everyone could see it. You didn't see it by looking at it. He had no stately glory that we should look on him, Isaiah says. It wasn't the kind that walked into the room and everybody immediately stopped because of the overwhelming power of his presence, at least in physical terms. There clearly was the sense that he became, but we perceived his glory. It was the glory as of the one and only of the Father. Now, most of our commentaries or Bible add the word son. It's not there in the Greek text, but it clearly when you talk about the one and only of a father, you'd be thinking of the one and only son. In the ancient world, the only son of a father was the hope of the family. It was the hope of the ongoing of the family name. There was a splendor and a dignity, the one and only son. And that's been part of 
every culture down through years that there's a special place. He's the only one, the unique one. The emphasis is on that remarkable, there's no one like him, no one to compare with him. He's incomparable, he's unique, he's the splendid one. But it's interesting when John describes him, he says, we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. It's not what we immediately think of when we think of glory. We think of Luke 2, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were very afraid. But John, or John is telling us it was the glory of grace and truth. Let me remind some of you, you've been with us as we made our way through the book of Exodus when Moses, and we'll come back to it in a few weeks. But you remember the moment that Moses in Exodus chapter 3 says, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And the Lord in effect says to him, you can't see the fullness of my glory face to face. But I will show you my back, as it were. And he takes him on the mountain and he displays his glory. What was the glory? A voice comes saying, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithfulness or truth. The glory of God that Moses understood was the glory of one who was full of of grace and truth. And that's what he's saying in a subtle way here. We saw he has the genuine glory of God. There is about him truth. And yet there's about him grace. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to keep those two things together? There's some people I know who are really good on truth. And they are always going to tell you exactly what this is and how it should be and what the truth is. And there's other people who are really big on grace. They're kind and soft and gentle. But they often had a great difficulty speaking the hard truth when it needs to be spoken. And the hard truth people find it very hard to be gracious and forgiving. And yet in Jesus, those two things come together. Of his fullness we've all received, he will say. Grace and truth. So where does this all come together? I can't understand the Trinity, although I can know the boundaries of it and the things the Bible clearly teaches, but I come at such a point and I think, I know it's true, but I still can't understand how there are three persons in one God. But God's revealed that. I believe it. I, I, I can't understand how Jesus could look no more significant than Bruce does, and that's not a put down on Bruce as he sits here. And yet, that would be God. I can't understand how the one who was hanging at the cross was the very same time, the one who'd created everything, and the one who could die. But that's who he is. And it's a reality that should first of all cause us to wonder, to be filled with a kind of awe that says, this story is not just simply of a story of a baby born in a manger, it's of God entering heaven. It is a bigger, more astonishing, and if this is true, it changes everything. Everything I understand about life, everything I understand about reality, if God has truly become a man, it changes everything. And if that God who became man not only came to tent among us, but to die for us, 
Then the second thing is it not only incites me to wonder, it arouses me to faith. That God would become human can never be an issue of secondary importance. It is of primary importance. And I need to know what he's done and to trust him. And we're sort of circling back because John had said in verse 11, he came to his own home and his own people did not receive him. But to as many as received him, that is to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. And the wonder of the word become flesh. Becoming the sin bearer as the tabernacle to deal with my sins causes me to trust him and bow the knee before him. And the reality is, if this is true, then the reality of what happened at the cross is something that commands me to obey him and proclaim him and to live for his glory so that the world may know who he truly is. So my question for those of you who listen, are you celebrating a cultural Christmas or a Christian Christmas? The only Christian Christmas is one that is centered on who Jesus is and is focused on receiving his gift and not merely receiving other people's gifts or giving them. Important and nice as a cultural custom that might be. God became man so that you could know your sins are forgiven and you're part of the family of God. And the call of scripture is to come in faith and trust to the word become flesh who became the Lamb of God in your place and on your behalf. And for those who have trusted Christ, then we come back to that truth as we come around the table that the Lord has given to us to remind ourselves of why the God-man became the God-man. To give his body, the word become flesh for us and to shed his blood in our place. And we take the symbols that he gives and we thank you and come before him in worship and gratitude.